Hello, and welcome to another episode of Unbottleneck, the podcast where we solve common and sometimes uncommon digital marketing problems. Today, our special guest with us is Kathleen Booth, who is the now CMO of Clean.io, the marketing leader in digital engagement security solutions. You'll hear about what that is in just a minute. Um, used by businesses looking to optimize their revenue and buyer experience by taking back control over third-party code on their websites. Prior to joining Clean.io, she spent 13 years in digital marketing, uh, first as owner of, and CEO of Quintain Marketing, and then as VP of Marketing at Impact. Kathleen is the host of the long-running Inbound Success podcast, look that one up, and was named by Top Rank as one of the top 50 B2B marketing influencers of 2019, and now as 2021. Uh, Kathleen, welcome to the show, and congratulations on the, uh, the promotion. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Likewise. So what what is this thing we're talking about? Digital engagement security. I've, that's, that's something, I've been in digital marketing for 22 years and I've never heard that phrase being used. Do I need to go back to school? Like, no, you know, <laughs> it's it's really just, I think, the natural outcome of, of a, an evolution that's been happening for a while, which is that, okay. you know, traditionally, uh, well, let me back up. All, all, all marketing, all business is really about selling one thing, and that is trust, right? I, right. You know, it doesn't really matter what the product is, what the service is, what industry we're in, we're selling trust. And that's why people choose to buy from us. And so traditionally with marketing, trust was established when somebody walked into your store or walked into your office or when you went door to door as a salesperson and met them. Like there was that human interaction and as the world has evolved and technology has developed, you know, we've increasingly moved to this online model. And in the last two years with COVID, it has just accelerated that dramatically. And so really now, uh, you know, for most companies, uh, either all or a large percentage of their business is done online. And, and that storefront, that office is now really the website. And so the, our primary goal as marketers is to establish a relationship of trust with our users, our visitors, our prospects, and our customers. And in order to do that, we have to create a safe and secure environment in which to have those digital engagements with our audience. Yeah, it makes, makes total sense too. And, and you think about websites 20 years ago, and it was mainly just text and links and a few really cheesy, you know, animated GIFs or whatever, right? And users users didn't put their credit card information online. They didn't know what SSL was, you know, and now we live in, in times where privacy is on billboards and, you know, security is, is paramount and browsers will let you know if you're not on a secure website. Um, and then when they do get to the website, they don't just want to see text. They want to see people. You know, when I worked for Disney, I can't remember a single ad or a single page that we created where there wasn't a guest staring back at the picture, staring at the person who was looking at it and smiling, right? There was this, this humanizing feature about it. And then, as you mentioned, during the pandemic, you know, we've been, we've been looking at and, and testing the difference in images when you show an image of somebody who's practicing, you know, social distancing and, and wearing masks, doing uh, curbside, cart side delivery and takeout versus not. And it feels like when I look at the, the numbers, it looks like we actually get more dwell time and, and more time on page when a user sees images that are up to date and, and show that they're, they're um, you know, thinking about the user, the visitor's safety and, and current times. So I feel like, I feel like there's an element there that, um, I don't know, that just, that just resonates with users immediately when they hit a website. What are, so what are some things that, um, you're just kind of thinking broadly about this topic, what are some things that, that brought this to, um, you know, to today, right? You said this is kind of a new thing, it's happened. Was it, was it the pandemic that made a big impact or was it just, um, just the evolution of, of how we do digital marketing today? I think a lot of it was the evolution of how we do digital marketing and really the the core at the core of this notion of digital engagement security is that you know we as marketers we were taught that we own our website right we talk about owned channels and certainly if we had a physical store or an office we we would own that in the sense that like we could control who walked in the front door and what happened there and what the decor was. Well on our websites you know I guess in theory we own them but but the reality is that the way the modern internet works, we build websites today with a whole host of third-party code, whether that is the content management system that you're building your site on, 
or a plugin or an app that you're putting on your site delivery network or a nitro pack or yeah Yeah. and then and then there's another category that we don't even i didn't even know about honestly until recently when i started working at clean.io which is um browser extensions they're called in cybersecurity world they're called client side injections which just means that's the code that the people who are visiting your website bring with them when they visit and so all of this third-party code is running, and some of it is what I would classify as trusted code. Mm-hmm. And then there's some code that you really don't know that much about, you know, um, and it and it runs the gamut. Um, but the whole idea is that while you might own your website, if if you are allowing third-party code to run on it, you don't truly have control over what's happening and you don't have control over the user experience and that impacts how your brand is portrayed and it can also trickle down and impact your revenue and so digital engagement security is all about controlling getting greater control over the third-party code on your site so that you do truly have the ability to control your user experience your brand and your revenue so interesting you know for for years we've been trying to teach our clients to to run any third-party scripts asynchronously through Google Tag Manager, so that you know they can have faster loading pages. We've we've spent lots of time trying to reduce page speed with all the the Google Page Experience updates and Page Speed updates um, by going into Tag Manager and stripping out anything that's not being used or or um, having it load a few seconds later. But we haven't really ever had those conversations about trust and what scripts we should be trusting and which ones we shouldn't. Um, as a marketer to understand that third party code, um, you know, why, why is it important? And, and what are, what are some things that we could do to kind of get started? Yeah, so I'll give you a bunch of different examples um, that might help kind of make this seem a little bit more concrete. And it really starts with, you know, if you're, if you're building a website, one of your first choices is where are you going to host it, right? And your hosting choice is, the, is your first and probably one of your most important decisions. Um, and, and making sure you have a host that takes frequent backups, that will, will put you in touch with a person if you have a problem. You know, right. the odds of anyone's website getting hacked are, are pretty good. Yeah, it's not that hard. Um, WordPress. Yeah, it's, uh, right. And so it's not necessarily a question of like, if you'll be hacked, it's when. And so when you are hacked, does your host give you the ability to restore your site quickly and to, to reclaim control? That's number one. Number two, then, is how are you building your site? You mentioned WordPress. And, mm-hmm. you know, WordPress is one CMS. There's plenty of them out there. There's if you're in e-commerce, you might be on Shopify. Okay. You could be building your site on a HubSpot. Um, so many decisions to make. And that CMS, you know, you need to first do your homework and find out what kind of security measures the CMS itself has taken. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, some WordPress is open source. And so that introduces its own set of complexities. Um, You know, with WordPress, for example, I generally advise people to host on WP Engine, which is a a hosting platform that was built just for WordPress. And if you're really, really security conscious, they have an option where you can have a dedicated server as opposed to a shared space. Um, You know, so there's options like that. But the CMSs are important to understand. And then, you know, when you think about all the things that you then layer on top of them. So depending upon what platform you're building on, they might call it an app or a plugin. Um, but you're probably adding other layers to your site, whether that's, um, you know, some sort of plugin that lets you embed video or something that ad- lets you add your Instagram feed to your site. Or even um, something custom that you had somebody build for you to have a feature on your site that might be open to vulnerability using, you know, an older JavaScript library, for example. Exactly right. And so, you know, some of these plugins and apps um, are what I would call known and very well respected. And and so you you can do your homework and pretty easily figure out that they're reputable, which doesn't also mean they're impervious, by the way. It just means that you can have more trust in the person that made it. And notice I say trust because they're selling trust just like we are. Um, And then there's others where you know, you might not be able to figure out like who's really behind this, who really built it and what kind of support do they provide and did they build it right? And are they going to maintain it? Because that's the other thing with code is that this is, you know, I always say it's like building a house. It's not like you build your house and then you're done. Like there's yeah. constant maintenance that needs to happen. And it's the same thing with any code you put on your site. Um, so understanding who's making these things, 
understanding how they're maintaining them. Um, and then beyond that also paying attention to any updates that get released about them. And so one of the stories I like to share about this, it has to do with WordPress and, um, if, if you, WordPress stories, (laughs) yeah, lots of WordPress stories. And, um, a lot of people who build websites on WordPress get their theme from um, the Envato marketplace. Very, yep. very well known, I've, right? I've purchased themes from them as well. Yeah. And and I think we all think of Envato as a really trustworthy marketplace. And I think by and large it is. But really, Envato is a marketplace. So just like Etsy is a marketplace and anybody can list something there, it's the same with Envato. People can build themes for sale on Envato. Right. And two years ago, I was working in a cybersecurity company and um, we were getting the announcements from the U.S. government's Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, so CISA for short, and they put out these posts whenever there are significant vulnerabilities discovered, and they put one out saying that there was a particular WordPress theme that was actually built with the express purpose of harvesting personally identifiable I information. Something about that. That's right. Yeah. So this is a great example of you might trust Envato, but you can't assume that because you trust the marketplace that the providers or the players in the marketplace are trustworthy. And, and look, it's not perfect. Like there's no way anybody could have known that this was the case about this theme until it was discovered. So what that means is then, are you paying attention to the news feeds that announce when these things happen? Like, and so I always say to people, CISA is great. It's U S government. They have a way you can just subscribe to announcements about big vulnerabilities. Um, So you know, that's important. Theme theme choice is important. Uh, and then really it goes to this, you know, the code that's on your site and then there's the code that's brought to your site. Um, right. And this was a big eye opener for me, this whole category of browser extensions. Yeah. Um, I did not realize until a few years ago that when you install an extension in your browser and, you know, you and I are talking over the internet and as we're talking, I'm literally looking at my Chrome browser and I can see all of these extensions. I probably yep. have 25 I have of my them. Built with and my um, Google Tag Manager legacy extensions. I've got um, Grammarly, right? Yeah, I would say like if your listeners are marketers, I too, I'm looking at built with, I have Vidyard, I have the Moz toolbar, I have an awesome screenshot, I have a color picker all kinds of things. And the the way extensions work is that when you install them in your browser, the browser recognizes this as, a, as being brought in by the user. And so it gives the extensions an elevated level of permissions to run scripts on sites. So they are able to function. Built with is able to deliver you the information that it that it has because it is able to scrape the sites you visit. And it's the same thing with all of these other extensions. Now, like everything else, there are trusted categories of browser extensions. And then there are, you know, I would say purely untrusted that where they're doing nefarious things. And then there's this middle gray area. Um, So a great example of the middle gray area is coupon extensions. Oh, right. Yeah. This is something that we focus on at Clean you know, a lot of people know Honey and Capital One Shopping right. and they think they're awesome. They give me a discount. I can pay less for my purchase. What they might not realize is that when you sign up to use it, you're giving the extension permission, not just to give you coupons, but when you legitimately receive a coupon from a retailer, let's say you're a VIP customer and they give you a special code to thank you for your business and you go and you type it in at checkout, you're giving that extension permission to scrape what you type in and then share it with everybody that uses the extension. Wow. And what that means then for the e-commerce business is it a couple things. Number one, it, it really it hits them hard in terms of their margins. Because if you think you're releasing, for example, a 10% off code only to people who subscribe to your newsletter and you decide it's worth it because you're getting their email in exchange yeah. and anybody then uses that code, all of a sudden everybody's got it. You're not getting their email. And you, you, you not only are you giving that discount away to a much larger audience, but you can no longer rely on that data for attribution to know what campaigns are working. Unless, unless you have a single use code, but yeah, it makes sense. And I've seen, I've seen some of those where you've done searches for coupons or um, discounts and you're like, wow, there's, there's a lot of coupon sites on it. Where, where are they getting all these, these coupons? And they make you 
try to sign up to to get them or to to interact with their sites to um, you know to be able to get whatever that code is. Some of them put it right in their meta description, so you can see it right in the description, uh, which I think is interesting. But I'm like, where in the world? So they're they're actually doing it using the browser extensions in the same way that digital marketing tools like SEMrush and Similar Web, you know, who who used to actually use servers that would use browser emulation to get search term data are now using those those same browser extensions to collect um, you know Google search keyword rankings uh, simply by using the you know the extension power that they've created that's so interesting I've never even thought about how much privacy we we give away just by installing you know a simple extension well and the thing that really made it hit home for me was we see because of where because of the, how we sit on page for e-commerce websites, mm-hmm. we see all the codes that Honey and Capital One are trying to inject. And mm-hmm. we see things like Military Hero 30. Clearly some merchant created this code and intended it for a veteran sure, or somebody who's an active duty service person. And all now it's being scraped and given to anybody. And the, the analogy I always make is like, uh, first of all, in the real world, that's called like stolen valor. If I were to walk into a restaurant and say, I served in the army, can I have 30% off? And if it was a lie, like most of us would agree that that's just unethical mm-hmm. and we wouldn't do yeah, it. I hope at veterans least. that's cause for a good butt whooping too, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But we do it online with coupon extensions. And so there's, a, I have so many examples of codes like that. And, and then there's also situations where, you know, merchants mess up and they accidentally issue a code that gives somebody a hundred percent off. I've seen this happen a few times. Oh, no. That's disastrous when that kind of a code gets out. And that's a very, very expensive mistake that wouldn't really be such a hard hit in the pocketbook if it weren't for a coupon extension. And so that's just, an, that's an example of how a browser extension can truly impact your brand and your revenue in a big way. Um, you know, there are other examples on um, another thing that we deal with a lot at clean is something called malvertising, um, that, which that is on my list to ask you about that. Yeah. That word was another new term. I'm, I'm learning so many new digital marketing vocabulary terms <laughs> today. This is amazing. <laughs> yeah. So, so malvertising happens on websites that accept ads and there are lots of websites like this, you know, our, our, we happen to work with a lot of large online publishers. So our customers include you know, websites like CBS Interactive, um, Barstool Sports, um, you know, Hearst, Meredith, et cetera. But any any website that accepts ads through the programmatic advertising ecosystem mm-hmm. is vulnerable to malvertising, which is essentially malicious ads. Okay. And as a user, I'm pretty sure everybody out there will have experienced it at least once when you go to a site and you click on something and then all of a sudden a pop-up comes up yeah. and you you can't close it. Or it takes you to some scam website that's trying to enroll you in a sweepstakes or a Bitcoin scam. Yeah. You know, there's it, it malvertising yeah. takes many different shapes, but the bottom line is that it's extremely bad user experience. And generally somebody then like churns from the site entirely, which for publishers is deadly because you know that's your conversion rate. Your conversion rate, you lose the odd. They may or may not come back. Or if they come back, they might come back with an ad blocker turned on. Mm -hmm. And if your business is based on ad monetization, that really hurts you. So that can be devastating for publishers. And um, and that's another, you know, that's just another form of third party code because really programmatic advertising, it's it's code that's coming through advertising exchanges, supply side platforms, demand side platforms. And when an ad renders on your site, it's really code that's calling back to a server mm-hmm. and asking that server to send instructions effectively. Right. So being able to control that, because that happens in real time when the ad is rendering, being able to control that is really important to being able to deliver that that seamless user experience. So yeah, I just talked for a really long time ads. and I'm going to stop now. <laughs> yeah, so these aren't 2003 ads where it's just a, you know, a JPEG or a PNG. There's HTML running in these ads. There's forms in some of these ads now, there's there's a lot going on um, to be dynamic and responsive to the way people use the internet now. So it makes sense that that in in that evolution, somebody found a loophole in a way to um, you know try to hack the system, and that's unfortunate because, you know, like you said, a lot of these sites have spent years putting content together for people based on a topic that they really are passionate about, and they monetize the ads. 
and one programmatic partner decides to let an advertiser in that compromises that. And it's it's unfortunate. Well, sure. and malvertisers are extremely savvy. Uh, we always say they're like some of the world's best performance marketers because, you know, most of the time these malicious ads are coming through pretty well respected advertising exchanges. And it's because the malvertisers are very creative. And mm -hmm. um, it used mm -hmm. to be the classic malvertising took the form of redirects where you would click on an ad thinking you were going to like a luggage site or something. And but really, it would take you to that sweepstakes site. Now they've gotten smart because those types of uh, redirects are easier to identify and block. So now there's things like ad stacking where okay. sites show invisible ads one on top of the other. And then, you know, you might accidentally click on it because it's invisible. And so it's it's fascinating how creative they've gotten and, and the techniques they've used to evade detection. That's amazing. This this whole world of of thinking about as as a, a website owner, whether you're a small business or a, a mid to large size business, that that we need to be thinking about these kind of things. It's not just about hey, let's make sure our page loads fast and that we've got an SSL certificate and that you know we're we're using keywords on pages to get rankings. It's also it's also about making sure we're looking at all those crazy scripts you know, that we're putting into our tag manager or embedding on our page because we never know. And sometimes, sometimes small businesses make poor decisions when they're thinking that they're doing something that's going to benefit their website or someone's, you know, nephew or cousin who's in school says, Hey, I want to try to do something. I think I can make you more money because a friend said to do X. And the next thing you know, your, your site's been compromised and, you know, it's, it, it could be a scary thing. Yeah. Um, and I think you said it best in the beginning when you said, do I need to go back to school? And it was <laughs> funny that you phrased it that way, because yeah. I always say, you know, th there's a lot of research out now that marketing leaders have bigger IT budgets than IT leaders do because we own so much of the tech stack. And sure. it is true that that and I don't know if it's changed in recent years, but certainly in, in my history, I've never heard of anybody studying marketing in college, taking a cybersecurity class, nope. you know, and it, I've never seen it in anybody's job description. And so here we have people who own the tech spend, who are not being educated about security and who are not being told they're responsible for it. And that makes us incredibly vulnerable as entry points into the organization. And so, you know, that's the thing I like to evangelize about on shows like this is like, hey, as a marketer, you have to care about this because you you own this. Certainly the website is one of many very important entry points mm -hmm. for malicious um, activity and, you know, and it could result in compromise of company servers. You could have ransomware right. or it could be, you know, these more innocuous but still very harmful things like, you know, affected user experience and, and revenue. Kathleen, it's so, it's, it's so interesting to think about how us as business owners as mar and marketers really focus on our bottom line. Like we want to, we want to drive revenue. We want to get more traffic. We want, uh, we want to do ads and and search engine optimization to get our pages to rank. We're so focused on driving the traffic that we don't we don't give enough time to the defense part. And you know we've we've been trying to work with some of our clients to focus on some areas of defense with ADA compliance and making sure we're not getting sued or having lawsuits and providing a good experience to those with disabilities with privacy you know with with GDPR and CCPA now in California and making sure that we've addressed you know all the things that we know some users care about more now than they did you know 2 or 3 years ago uh, security and SSL and using SSL labs to make sure our our site's secure and you know, running some scans to make sure there's no malware. So this is, to me, this is another thing that I think all webmasters and students who are taking digital marketing classes, I'm teaching a few myself, um, need to start paying more attention to. And I don't, I don't know where the prioritization goes in the in the scheme of things. I know that it's it's something that that should be a top priority. Um, but do they prioritize it over over their full marketing plan, or do they say, you know what, this is this is the gate. I don't even want to do marketing until I've made sure my site's secure, accessible, and protected from advertising. To me, I think that might makes more sense. And I think as as the digital marketing programs continue to evolve, maybe that's part of landscape. Maybe that is, hey, before we're going to get into SEO, SEM, email marketing, um, paid advertising, paid media, 
uh, PPC, before we get into affiliate marketing, all these other marketing topics, let's let's make sure that we've got the fundamentals down, the landscape of uh, of you know digital marketing, and that that is security, privacy, accessibility, and and maybe this does. But tell me what you think. Do you, does you think this this falls underneath security, privacy, or something completely different? So I I would say I mean this is part of why I talk about it as digital engagement security because sure I could call it cybersecurity but most marketers their eyes would roll into the back of their heads and they would stop paying attention and I, that's why I think we do need to think about it differently like it 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 is right. its own thing its own new discipline it's marketing security could be another right. way of putting it um, I think honestly if if nothing else if we raise awareness that that mm-hmm. it's something that you should pay attention to that goes a long way because I just think that marketers haven't even asked the questions in the past um and so we we've, we've been living in this state of blissful ignorance mm-hmm. um so raising awareness making sure you're asking questions when you're vetting new technology solutions or apps or plugins or whatever um you know having a really good uh, partner that's able to help you. Most companies have some sort of IT solution, right? Whether it's a person sure. in-house who runs IT or whether it's a managed services provider. Um, more and more these days, managers, managed services providers have their own cybersecurity kind of offering. And, mm-hmm. and I think not just letting the relationship with them be in the hands of your IT leader, but as a marketing leader, becoming involved and asking them to take a look at the site to help you vet all the different you know scripts you have and and just to again to ask those questions and then to have good hygiene in terms of like regularly reviewing all the apps and plugins you're using and paying Such attention to those announcements step. i love that just ask we use a company called uh optiva right and they're in the inland empire and steve diaz over there he every quarter he comes in and he does this big audit and make sure that our systems are secure our our routers are all password protected, that we're using the right firewalls. We should be doing the same thing for our websites, you know, even though they're not hosted in your in your office. I think it makes sense. You reach out to your web host and say, you know, hey, I need to do a security uh, audit. Um, do you offer something like that? And, um, and if not, do you have some recommendations? All hosting companies probably have, uh, have to start thinking about their responsibility and being able to be proactive and suggesting through email that that every business owner do some sort of cybersecurity um, audit check to see how how they're protecting their their visitors and um, you know has some sort of a script check because nothing like that really exists other than just small you know agencies and some brands that that do this kind of thing. Um, well, then came your business, right? Don't don't you do something like that for um, you know for business owners who have websites? We don't do audits per se, but it's funny as I'm listening to you talk about it, I'm thinking, gosh, there's a real business opportunity here. No, we do. We write URL click. Yeah. We're, (laughs) we're building a platform solution um, right now that, that specifically helps with those two things I mentioned. One is malvertising and the other is um, the coupon extension problem, Mm -hmm. but you know, it is, it is early days of a growing platform. And so I envision that in the, you know, our goal is to basically uh, to, we envision a future where website owners will truly be able to control all of the third-party code that executes on their site. That's where we're heading. That'd be amazing. Yeah. yeah because Tag Manager is just it's just a very simple, lightweight tool where you can inject pretty much anything you want to, and they're not they're not vetting it. They're not warning you and saying, "Hey, we we noticed the HTML code that you want to embed is one that's been flagged in our our database as being malicious." They don't do that, which is crazy because they're the biggest you know, the biggest company in the world, right? Google's yeah. like, it's, you would think that that they would have by now um, figured out what scripts are harmful and which ones aren't. So I think what you're doing is great. And I think all business owners need to, like you said, be aware of it. And I think all, all digital marketers should go through some level of cybersecurity training at least once a year, because as you mentioned, it's, it's evolving how we word it, what we look for, and more than anything, some of the hyper-aggressive uh, malvertisers that are out there are are you know creating a, an ecosystem that we have to keep up to date with. So thanks for keeping us sharp, guys. But geez, making a making a lot more work, I think, for webmasters that are just trying to grow their business online. And now we've got to spend more of our time trying to protect our brand and monitor links that are coming in, monitor our web server to make sure that we've got some redundancy. And now 
uh, monitor to make sure that you know we're not um, you know putting ourselves in a place where someone's going to visit our website and be able to scrape code or or scrape information that's being typed into uh, forms and so forth. Such an interesting dynamic. Um, anything you think that business owners can do beyond just you know asking the the right questions to get started? Are there some tools that you recommend? Um, that they start looking at or something that, that business owners can kind of get a first start at? You know, I think there's a couple things that anybody can do. One is um, to go to CISA.gov, C-I-S-A.gov, and they have lots of links off to really great basic uh, cybersecurity training programs. Awesome. I think, you know, taking an introductory course is a great starting point because it just makes you aware of the different types of vulnerabilities and of course, subscribing to their updates. So then you see if there's, you know, if something has, um, a breach has happened and you need to know if it affects your site, that's a great way to begin to flag that. So that's number one. I would say investing in cybersecurity training for your employees is very important. And there are a lot of good online providers of that now where people can take online courses that teach them about, you know, not just things related to the website, but what does phishing, you know, email phishing look like and, you know, all the different categories of what is what's called social engineering. It's a whole right. different topic. The um, universities require them. Both, all the colleges I'm speaking at, I actually have to, uh, have to go through that, that whole two hour, two to three hour uh, training where they go through, like you were mentioning, here's what phishing is. And yeah. if you get an email, it looks like this and, you know, what not to do. It's, it's a really good training course. And uh, so you're saying they offer a lot of these offer them for free too, right? And especially on the, the some of them do. Training. And and then the ones that are paid are pretty reasonably priced. And so nice. I'm a big believer in investing in that. And then, like I said, having a relationship with a managed security services provider who can come in periodically and, you know, do that audit. And if you have a question, you've got somebody to go to and they can, right. they can have your back really. Peace of mind. I love it. This has been great. Is there is there some way that people can can reach you if they had more questions about what we talked about today, or uh, tell us a bit more about the the product and how um, you know how you're helping businesses? Sure. So um, if people want to reach me directly and ask questions, I'm very active on LinkedIn, and I connect with everybody. So feel free to head there, and I do, and I do answer if somebody has a question. Um, and then, you know, you can find more information about the company and the products at clean.io. And we, we have two products right now. One is Clean Ad, which is our solution that protects publishers from malvertising. And the other is Clean Cart, which helps e-commerce retailers uh, control how coupon extensions interact with their websites. And so you can definitely find more information about both of those on the site. That sounds amazing. I, I definitely want to look into both. I have a few clients that uh, run some Shopify sites as well. So uh, I'm definitely going to reach out and let them know that, you know, hey, this is something you need to start looking at and paying closer attention to. And I'm I'm definitely going to take a lot of what we talked about today and incorporate it into some of the courses I'm teaching at, at UC San Diego and Cal State Fullerton. I think this Love has been it. amazing. Any, any kind of final last words for our listeners today? No, just, um, you know, I think if you are a marketer, you just really have to rethink um, your outlook on on security. You know, like I said, we we most of us were never taught that it was our job, but you do own a significant portion of the company tech stack. And that means that you are responsible for the ways that that tech stack affects the company's security posture. And so you need to, you need to start educating yourself and you need to begin to take ownership of this. Um, and if you do that, you're going to, you're going to position yourself as a very forward thinking marketer, which can only help in your career. And it'll give you peace of mind that you're not going to get one of those scary letters from somebody who found that their privacy was violated. So exactly. that's always a good thing too. Well, thank you so much for being on the show and, and guys, uh, I'll put some links in the description and on the page so that we can, uh, make sure that you get all that great content and what links to go to and what to think about. I'll even put a little checklist together because you came up with some really good ideas and kind of some step by step. So I'll organize it in a way that you can distribute it to your IT team and um, and get it on the calendar once a quarter to make sure that you're you're paying attention to it. And um, this has been great, guys. Thanks so much for listening. Kathleen, thanks for being a guest today. Thanks for having me. This was a ton of fun.